and suddenly now we have our backup. And our backup, what's interesting, it has our port 8080. Hi, welcome to this episode where we're going to look at Viper for Golang. Viper is a library that comes as a companion to Cobra. And I've been talking about it in my previous video because it's really interesting to use as a low ops configuration tool. It's particularly cool because you can take a Golang file, you can take an environmental file, or you can inject EMVs into your program and Viper knows how to aggregate those all together and to give you the right configuration. So this is going to be a sort of an introduction to that tool and also how you get it working with your Cobra environment, which we looked at last time. And if you haven't checked that video out, go back and have a look at how to build a beautiful CLI with Golang on my channel, and you'll see the step-by-step -step on how to put that into place. So let's take a quick look at what we've got today. So on the left, I've got this toolbox code, which was the project that I had last time. Uh, toolbox, remember, it just had a disk usage command and an info command that we built. And on the right, I've got my terminal. And then behind this, I've got um, the website for Viper. So it's by SPF 13 again. And uh, if you go down, you can install Viper. Or if you're using Cobra, you can init your Cobra project with Viper, like we did last time. So what you'll see if you've used Viper in your project for Cobra is that you'll get in your root go some extra commands. And this is the most important one, this init config. You see here, it will effectively uh, just lock in. So now that we've had a look at our config, and we understand how it works. Really the next thing to do is to show a simple example. So what we're going to do now is create our first key value pair. So you can see I'm using set here and that lets me provide a key with a value of an interface type which means in Cobra and Viper together you can start passing around data structures as well. But we'll come on to that later. So I've set the name of Alex. Now to access that inside my config command I need to use Viper's global property. So let's print it out. We're going to say viper.get our Viper, and that will access the global Viper instance. And I want to then get name. Now, instead of using get directly, I'm going to do a get string so that it does the casting automatically. So I don't need to take care of that. Uh, and once we've got that, I will feed in my name. And then at this point, we're ready to test it out. Uh, we can see my name is printed, right? So it's got the name that I've set in the root config just here. So that's pretty easy, right? And that pretty makes sense how you can use Viper straight away. But I don't think that's what's super interesting about it. What's interesting is, as I said at the beginning, the way that you can actually input config files, read from config, and override that config. So I'm going to show you a really simple example. So if you go down into the Viper docs, it can be a bit overwhelming because there's a bunch of stuff in here. But this is probably the most important part that I learned from. And this is how you read the config. So let's take this exact example. So what I'll do is I'll make a config file. I'll call it uh, toolbox, toolbox.conf. And what I'll do in that config is I'll just copy this YAML here, right? Uh, I'm just going to omit, change that to a lowercase. So we've got some, some valid looking YAML in this toolbox.conf. And we could even rename that just for uh, clarity to be a YAML file. Okay, now you see it says you got to read it in and then you can start querying it. So let's try that. So what's the first thing we need to do? Well, if you look at the Viper root.go, you'll see that we're already setting the config type and the config name by default. But what we're also doing is we have this optional config file flag that gets added in to the program. So what this means is when we're not setting this, the default is .toolbox.yaml in our home directory for any config that gets read, or we can override that. So in my case, for this example, I want to override that. So what I should be able to do is main.go config dash dash config, and then set toolbox.yaml, right? That, that should work because that's my, my config file. And you'll see actually it says using config file. And I presume that comes from here, right? Where it's doing the config read in. So let's go back to this config file here and let's change something to pull the config from toolbox. So if I go down to, let's say, uh, hacker or 
eyes. Let's pick eyes. It might be a good example. I'll take eyes there. And we'll go and we'll remove that um, previous line I have. I think I've done that. There we go. So what should happen here is that the config is picking up and I can read uh, eyes. So let's see what happens. So there you can see the config file of toolbox.yaml is using eyes as the key and the color of brown is coming out. So already this is super exciting because we can do a bunch of stuff with this. Um, equally, you might think, well, how do I access different parts of YAML? So clothing.jacket is a good example, or uh, clothing.trousers. Well, the way you do that is there's a dot syntax. So if you want to get that string, you say clothing.trousers, like that. And you can then see denim is the, the type of trousers. Um, this is all in the docs. The one thing I would say is that the docs are quite dense. So I hope that this helps to give you a high level of how to use some of this stuff. There is a ton you can do uh, in Viper. I mean, I'm only just scratching the surface in this tutorial, but you can also use things like remote config uh, and add providers and all sorts of really interesting stuff with Viper. So do bear in mind that what we're going to cover here in the, in the, in the tutorial is like 5 to 10 percent of the capabilities of what Viper can actually do. So let's get back to it and have a little look at actually building something that might be somewhat useful. So we've got this idea that we can start to uh, pass stuff in from a YAML file. Well, let's think about making something useful. And let's think about it in the context of the commands that we already have. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this config file because I've, I've explained how the config works. And I think we feel comfortable with that. But let's go down and look at our previous commands and just remind ourselves of what they actually do. So we have that disk usage command. So that was the idea that we could go, go run main. And then we'd see we have uh, info. And then in info, we have disk usage. And you see that it would print out uh, some, some uh, representation of the object. In fact, we probably want to make something a little bit more human readable and just go for what is our current uh, free disk usage. And it's not happy because I was giving it a string and that comes out as an int. Um, so you can see we've got a number here, representation. It's still not super duper um, easy for us to read. And again, we've got some options. We can print out some different properties uh, from this. But for now, that's fine. We will we'll stick with uh, disk usage free. OK, so free disk space. There we go. And uh, presumably, that's going to be in bytes. So what I could do with config is to change the default directory that new disk usage command runs on. So probably what I would do is if I was building this in a structured way, for different commands to use, I would do something like this. I would say something like command, and then I'd sub it info disk usage default directory. And I would set that like that. And I would do this because that makes it extensible. And if you remember, you know, one of the things we were talking about last time was that if multiple teams are using your CLI, you have to have a structured approach to how you uh, create your palette, but also how you create your configuration as well. So let's jump back into this and have a quick look at how that might look. So what we'd probably say is something like uh, default directory is going to be that dot for current directory. But then we need an override so that if the um, config has been loaded, then it will use that. So what we're going to say is something like uh, viper dot get uh, viper dot get string. And we will put that full path in. So if, uh, and I'll, I'll change the, the name in a moment, if duh. And we have to do an evaluation here. Say if it's not equal to nil. And then we'll set the default directory to it. Um, and of course, directory is not the name of that path. It's going to be command info disk usage default directory. So command.info. Disk usage dot, um, I think I called it default directory. Okay, so what we're saying here is if there is nothing set, use the default. Otherwise, we will override the default directory. So, what we should see is when we run this command twice, we get two different results based on if you have the config added or not. So, let's give this a go and see what happens. So, first one. Now, let's add in, in fact, I'll have to give it a different path, otherwise we'll see we'll see no difference. So uh, 
Let me just uh, grab a quick example. Okay, so the other one will be set to this full path. Now let's try that. So first example in the current directory, second example should work in that other directory. And you'll see that there's a difference uh, in the two sizes because one of them is operating in the other directory as well, which is great. Okay, so what we've learned there is that you can add an override. And just to be sure that works, I just want to give one final little nod to it. We can just say uh, free space, free disk space in directory. And we'll just pop that in there. Just so we really understand that example. You'll see there, it's at the end. And of course, free space will jitter a tiny amount based on what's going on in my operating system at any one given time. So super interesting. Now, what happens if you want to do something a bit different? What happens if you want to change your config on the fly? This is a pretty normal thing, right? You might have some state that you need written back to disk. Well, in the example here, from the docs, and I've just scrolled in there, you'll see that there is actually a section around writing config just here called writing config files. And this can be a little confusing. So I wanted to just sort of take us through it step by step, because this is probably one of the, the activities that you'll come up against quite frequently. Typically, what you might do is have a combination of pre-existing config, program defaults, and you might want to um, write those back out into an updated program at the end. So as an example here, in our root.go, we have the config file being read in. But what you can also do is you can set some defaults. Now, what's a default? A default is something that might be in the program but might not exist uh, in, in, the, uh, in the config. So I'm just going to update the defaults. And I'm going to call this set defaults. The set default commands here. There we go. We're going to say viper dot set defaults. Uh, and that would be our, that's a great example, port 8080. Might be a default port that we operate on. And a default is really useful because it shows you what gets set when you have no flag or config. So this is something you can reliably program against. A bit like that disk usage here, the problem with using this is that if none of these objects exist in the config, you'll have a problem, um, or even some of them exist but others don't, you'll have a problem and you'll have a fallback always pitting hit. Also, you could set a default, so you could do a viper.get default, um, sorry, viper.get on that string for the directory, and that would always work as a default value. So defaults are super useful in different scenarios. But again, these aren't being codified back out into the config. So there does sometimes need to be a case where I can write my viper config back out. So let's say that I set my default here, but I also then want to write that config back out again. So what I can do is I can do a write config as. So I'm going to do a viper dot write config as, and I'm going to do it in my current directory and call it toolbook.yaml.backup. And this gives me this idea that I have a file that is written locally. So we'll just add a little um, bit of error handling here. There we go. So when I then run a command locally, I can see that I have this set. Now, interestingly, we have config type backup. Now that's because I've ended the file in a dot backup and it uses the file name to determine how to write it out. So let's just see if that works a bit better. So what I did there was I moved backup from after the YAML to before and suddenly now, and suddenly now we have our backup. And our backup, which is interesting, it has our port 8080 and that's really, really useful because that's given me this default that's been added. What you will see, though, is that it didn't add this structure from the toolbox.yaml because that already exists in the other config. So if you do want to write out and, and aggregate um, between multiple configs, you actually have to do a, a loop to write the current config into the new config. And that's something... Uh, I can take on in probably another video, but I just want to touch on that this then lets you write out anything you've got dynamically at runtime uh, or as a default. So it could well be quite useful if you're storing states, positioning, offsets, those sorts of things.
The final thing that I wanted to talk about is overriding. So there is an ability in Cobra to override with environmental variables that's super useful. Let's go back to uh, a simple example here. So if I set something like a name and I say viper dot uh, set in fact we'll just call it uh, name Alex and then what I can also do is I can do something like format dot print line uh, viper there we go okay and then it's no surprises what will happen here we should see that my name is printed out what you can also do is with environmental properties is you can override things and this can be very very useful so you'll see that we have this function called automatic env which actually gets called at the bottom of our file here that automatic env uh, will bind environmental variables into uh, key value pairs in the program so it sounds fairly complicated but it's actually very very simple to use What's important to understand though is this example is you need a few bits and pieces set up to really make it work. One thing is this SP is this uh, set env prefix. The env prefix is the prefix on your environmental variable before it will read in and you probably want this otherwise you'll get a collision with system variables. For example, if I set name and I want to call name, the system env for name would be like that. The problem is that might collide with other stuff so what you can do is you can set this env prefix and in this case it will be toolbox so what my toolbox env prefix would give me is the ability to oops viper is ability to set toolbox before bob here in my name there we go like that and according to the example you can see that you also then have this uh, property of bind env uh, that bind env is something that we can do however we can also just use the example here where you're actually able to use the get on there so let's this let's give this a go so we've got toolbox set as our prefix we're going to go to bind env so I'm going to go and grab the name firstly I'm going to remove my example completely I'm then going to go get string and that's going to be toolbox name Let's see what we get. So if I export to outside of here, there we go. And so you can see that it's a little bit sensitive to where we're positioned, but that's important to understand is that actually you need to call it after the automatic env, and that was my mistake. But now we've got Bob being passed in. Now I did also mention it can be used as an override. That's because if we combine the two techniques together and we have the set default we set the default as Alex and we also do a bind what should happen is that whatever the bound name is from the environment variable overrides uh, the default name. So if I actually just unset Bob So I have to open up a new terminal to do this. Go around main. You can see that the name has gone back to Alex in the new terminal. And that's because that's the default, but Bob uh, is the override, which is super useful in a lot of different scenarios. So I hope you found this useful. We've gone through quite a lot of stuff there from how to add a set and a get for Viper how to create a config file, read that in and read some of that config, how to write that config back out, and how to work with environmental variables. And as you saw, it can be a bit fiddly on the placement, but in this video, I will make sure that the, the code that I've used is uploaded so you have that reference point to see that when you actually make those changes for binding an environmental variable, setting a default, it's always done after the init block for Viper. I really hope you've liked this video. I really enjoy making them. Please do like and subscribe. Leave comments uh, if you'd like to. Again, all the code samples will be made available. And I hope that you find this useful in your own code base. I'd love to know what you use it for. Thanks again. Bye.